uh, feel free to ask questions uh, at any time. Uh, our hope is, you know, our hope is to make this as useful for the three of you who are here now, whoever joins uh, for the rest of the uh, webinar, and also for anybody who would watch this later on, because uh, it's being recorded and will be put on our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you for those of you who are here. I'm going to introduce myself and the folks that you have around. Uh, my name is Tom Anowitz. I am the College Division Manager for USA Ultimate. Uh, I'm the full-time employee here at USA Ultimate. Uh, to my, I believe it, it's my, what, my left, uh, is Amy Hudson, the National Developmental College Coordinator. Um, she is part of the college working group and part of our national core of volunteers that help run the college season um, and is particularly involved in STAR programming and, and helping new teams get involved uh, with USA Ultimate. Uh, directly below me, we have Anna Nazaroff, or Mad Dog. Uh, she is the coach of the Cal women's speed team, the Tarts. Uh, Anna is also a longtime player for Fury, a member of the World Games team. Uh, and she just returned from Japan, where she played uh, at the Dream Cup with the World All-Stars. Um, Anna, am I missing anything? You got it all. All right, all of it, your whole, your whole life story. Um, and then below Amy and next to Anna, we have uh, three of the captains of the Cal uh, B women's team. Uh, Anna is in the middle. Um, on Hannah's left, uh, we have Alicia, and on Hannah's right, we have Elena. Hannah, do you do you all want to introduce yourself? Sort of uh, let us know a little bit about you guys. How long you've been captaining, and how long you've been part of the Tarts? Uh, so I'm a sophomore. I joined the Ultimate program when I was a freshman, fall semester, and then I captained in um, the spring last semester, and I'm also captaining now. My nickname is. <laughs> um, I'm Elena or Poppins. I this is my first time captaining, um, but I've been on the tarts for the past two years. Cool. Yeah, I'm Alicia. I'm a third year here, um, and I'm Chip also. Um, and I've been playing on the tarts. This is going to be my third year. Cool. My first captain. Well, well, welcome. We're excited to have you all. So, at this point, I'm going to leave it to Amy, who's sort of going to lead the discussion about about Dev. Uh, and we'll go from there. Great. So I think we were going to start this uh, conversation off with a bit of a description of your team culture, the Tarts team culture. Uh, if the captains could get a little bit into that. Um, how did you get recruited to become a leader of the team? Uh, how do you work with Anna and your co the other co-coaches? Um, yeah, and how, how it maybe has developed over the years. And, and just to add, in addition to Anna, there are two other coaches, uh, Katie Spinnerton and Kyle McBard, who are, who are not with us, but also a big piece of the TART team. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think the best part about the Cal women's team is that it's all about strong women supporting other strong women and looking on how you can improve that. And I think one of the biggest levels of our team is the support of and support to improve. And so it's no matter what your skill level is, no matter what your background, no matter your time commitment, you can come to practice and find people supporting you. And it's all about creating the culture of that positive reinforcement. Yeah, and our team is a little unconventional because in the fall semester, um, both of us are combined practice together and then we're doing training over winter break is when we do our cuts and form the ATP team. So we create that uh, team culture start right from the beginning in the fall and then um, create our own tarts culture later on. At the beginning of the spring semester, after the teams have been decided, all the both teams get together, and in the TARTS meeting, we elect captains and officers, and we have a general discussion about the type of culture that we want. We usually think of a couple key words that we want to think about throughout the season that um, uh, really are the core values and things that we want to look up to and try and achieve um, throughout the season. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, is there is there a way that you um, have a sustained leadership 
uh, in between your start of the fall season going, uh, sorry, finishing of the spring season going into the fall season, is this mainly taken on by coaches that you work with? Or is there someone who really just says, I'm going to be a leader next year? And I think Spot can speak more to this, but um, we do at the end of the season have a meeting between both teams. So that's when you bring back the queens and the tarts together and you talk about um, your positioning and like the um, officers for the next season. And so that's like decided before summer gets out. So you have those leaders being influential players throughout the summer and figuring out details and coordinating with coaches. Because that was spot this past summer. Yeah, we, at the end of the spring semester, we all get together and elect captains that are going to be um, the leaders for the program in the fall as well. And so those people, I was one of those. And so we worked throughout the summer to plan um, how we were going to recruit people in the fall. And then we worked, we helped with uh, the decisions um, for the players who were going to be on the A team and on the B team in a discussion with captains, I mean, with the coaches. And then we helped plan spring training too. And so that was like kind of the constancy. And then um, there's a bit of a transition when we have the split between the teams, but that's why we have a meeting before we start formal practices for the A teams and the B teams when everyone gets together and elects the captain. So there really isn't a time when there isn't leadership, which I think is really um, helpful. And it's just kind of a constant thing where there's always someone who's there. And going back to the having the two teams as one in the fall, is that really makes you comfortable reaching out to the other, to other team if you have a question or like the other team's leadership because you're going to be already familiar and you're already going to have that experience of like how they lead and someone to show you the way. <laughs> I don't think we can hear you. <laughs> you were on mute while you were talking. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can put myself back on mute too. Um, uh, that's very cool. Thanks for elaborating on that. I'm wondering if you can also talk a little bit about um, goal setting within the TART and how your leadership feeds into that and how you create buy-in for those goals. Okay. Um, so the coaches kind of are facilitating this right now. We have a survey um, that people can form their own goals, and then the people on the team work with the coaches to fulfill these goals. And so um, basing off of their responses, they can learn how to set their own goals. Um, the survey was, or like the Google form was really descriptive. Um, on how to make a concrete goal. And so that was really helpful for forming our own goals. It helps um, our like individual development and then make sure that while we're playing and practicing, we can focus um, on these one or two different things and then have the coaches come in and help us with those things. And so it was this kind of collective thing. So because it was a group effort, the individual player had to point out things that they wanted to work on and then the coaches can form their feedback based on these individual things. And so I think that's one of the ways that we facilitate goal setting, especially this season. Cool. So you, Hannah, you just mentioned that the coaches sort of help set the goals. Anna, what do you guys do as the, as the coaching staff to sort of, I, I, what are you thinking about when you're setting goals for the team? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there's there's two types of goals, right? Um, like the captains were saying, there's the individual goals that um, we try to push everybody on the team to sort of think about, okay, what is something, you know, starting with what is something that I want to get better at and then being able to break that down into a SMART goal, which I'm now not going to remember what that stands for, but something measurable. And maybe captains can help me out here because you guys just did that survey. What does SMART stand for? With. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so um, basically the, that um, Google form walked people through trying to figure out, okay, you know, I want to get better at my forehand, and just saying that isn't, gonna, isn't concrete enough to 
um, actually, you know, put in the work and get better at it. So how do we break it down even further? How do we measure our improvement? Um, all that. And so those um, are the individual goals. And then um, right before our second to last tournament, we'll meet individually with every single person on the team and just check in with them, see how it's going, um, how they've been uh, progressing on their goals, what can we as coaches do to, to further help. Um, and then the other side of things is that then, then there's the team goals, right? And um, I think for a developmental team, um, it's a little bit more reactionary than maybe for uh, a, like an A team or like a, a more elite type of team. Um, you know, for example, like uh, with a team like Fury, um, we are lucky enough that we get to, you know, we have the opportunity to set goals that are outcome-based, um, and that's obviously a little bit harder to do with a developmental team because, first of all, you have no idea who you're going to be playing from one game to the next, what the season looks like, um, how the players are going to develop, et cetera, right? So then it comes down to, um, okay, you know, one of my biggest goals every year is that every single person is able to catch the disc and confidently turn up field and hit another player, right? And something that we say every, every year is like, okay, yeah, you know, we could score a ton of points by having our best thrower just chuck it to our tallest player, right? And there's plenty of teams in the country that do that and are very successful. Um, and the young players learn that, okay, they catch it up field and they immediately look to the dump. They don't even bother to look up field. And one of my goals is like, no, everybody here is, is here to learn and everybody here is to get better at ultimate. So, you know, you're you're going to catch it and you're going to be able to look up field and you're going to be able to go through your progressions and break the mark if needed. And um, if that's not there, you're going to be able to swing it to the dump and the dump is going to be able to throw the swing throw and we're going to be able to score on the break side, right? So um, it, becomes, it becomes about kind of breaking it down into... Um, Like, are we doing the right things on the field versus um, are we are we winning those points or are we winning those games? I, I mean, honestly, like that's that's not a bad thing for people to focus on at any level. You know, are are we doing are we applying the things that we worked on at practice into a game setting? Does that answer. Yeah, Tom? absolutely. Thank you. That's great. And and so, Captain, how do you three ladies work to create traditions with your teams or promote traditions with your team to uh, help these, to help create this buy-in into these different goals that you guys have set as a team with your coaches? Um, we have a mates program that we implement. Um, so basically, whoever wants a mate can fill out a survey and according to what their goals are and what they want out of a mate, we pair them up with somebody else who, we try to um, make it like set and rookie, um, but if not, then it'll be rookie and rookie, but um, um, they just have somebody who can like check up on them or throw with them or do whatever they need to do to help uh, complete the goal. That's one of the things we do. Yeah, we're pretty lucky where the queens, I think, have really established this strong system of support for everybody and um, working with those goals. And so along with the mates, um, whenever we go to tournaments, we assign um, like one specific person to be your buddy for that tournament. And then that's another person that you can look forward to support and like um, talk and like just um, like ways to improve throughout the weekend. And so then that's another thing. And what we've started doing is um, so the Friday before the tournament, the two-day tournament, you'll talk with your buddy and you'll say a goal for the weekend. And so then that buddy is responsible for, like, helping you attain that goal, like, giving you advice. And then at the end of the tournament, we, um, everyone goes around and says one thing that their buddy did really well and, like, whether they achieved that goal or not. Um, and so it's just it's another way of holding each other accountable for those goals. Yeah. After every tournament, too, we write up highlights for every player in the next email that we send, and so it's kind of like a, um, a pump-up thing, and so after people see that 
everyone else has been noticing these amazing things that everyone else has been doing. It's really awesome to read it yourself and then read other people's. And so I think that's what a lot of people look forward to. Um, and so it kind of gets them to work harder. And it, it's great that other people realize that we're all seeing each other. <laughs> Um, one big um, uh, program-wide tradition that we have, and you heard Spot mention it earlier, is this thing called spring training. Um, and I just want to tell you guys a little bit about what that is, because I think it's the coolest thing. Um, so in the fall, we all play combined, and then everybody leaves and goes on spring break, spring break, winter break. Um, and, you know, that's a long time. That's like five or six weeks that, that people aren't apart. So... During that, we do what's called workout wars, which is a competition, a workout competition where you log your points, and um, at the end there's prizes both for, uh, you know, whoever worked out the most. Each workout is, has a point value, um, depending on how hard it is, and then we also give out prizes for people who threw the most. Um, and then a week before the spring semester starts, anybody who wants to can come back a week early, and, you know, the dorms aren't open yet, so the people that have houses or apartments are hosting everybody else that doesn't have housing yet. And uh, really, it's just like a week of Frisbee camp. Um, they'll do a morning workout that either the captain's lead or a guest coach from the community comes by and leads, um, you know, either like stadiums or agility footwork or a trail run. Um, and then during the day, well, I don't actually know what you guys during the day, but I think you guys do fun things like crafts and other bonding activities. And, I don't know, the pipe wings and the tarts love to bake things, so I think they bake things a lot. Um, but And then in the evening, um, they have their second practice with the coaches. Um, and it's Monday through Thursday that week, and um, it's a tryout for the A-team. But the cool thing is that anybody that wants to can come. So, you know, in the, in the last two years, we've had, like, 40 people attend and say, like, 30 of those are trying out for the A-team, then there's a handful of people who for sure know they want to play on tarts, and they're just coming out to hang out, and then there's, um, you know, another handful of people who may or may not come back in the spring um, because they're going abroad or whatnot, but they just love it so much that they come out and hang out. So um, that's, like, another really cool team tradition that I think helps bring both teams close together and bring the, the two coaching staff together because we work together to design that week. Um, pretty cool thing. Super cool. I'm going to move on uh, to our next slide now and talk a little bit more um, about Anna's role in the division and working with TART. Um, and we can also talk a little bit more about how Anna, you fit in with your co-coaches and the captains in, um, in, in like, logistics stuff. Like, how often do you guys meet? Um, and then go on to there, into, onto your personal, why you chose to coach. Okay, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if there's barking dog in the background. But there's a little nugget over here, hanging out. Um, sorry, what was your first question? That was a lot. <laughs> Sorry, logistics uh, of how you actually physically uh, coach and do um, planning and stuff with the team, and then going yeah, on. Yeah, totally. Your... Yeah, so, I mean, one of the cool, or, or one of the reasons that um, I wanted the captains to be on this webinar is, like, <laughs> really oftentimes, or, like, for the majority of things, me and my two co -coach coaches, we just show up and we teach things. And like literally everything else is handled by the captains and um, the other officers and whoever else wants to step up. So, I mean like from tournament logistics to figuring out where they're going to stay to cars to um, practice fields, um, filling out forms with the registrar. I mean, I probably don't even know half the things that the captains handle because they're just so good at handling it. Um, and so really what me and Katie and Kyle are in charge of is coming up with practice plans and then showing up and teaching them. Um, at tournaments, we don't even call lines. Um, we, we give that role to the captains to make sure to pay attention um, 
you know, watch for people that are self-selecting themselves out of tough points or watch for people that are too shy to go on, watch for people who might be going on too much and um, try to make sure that everybody's getting equal playing time. And, you know, even in really high pressure situations, like we've been in those double game point games and we don't do it. We don't do a thing where we like, okay, let's send out all of our veteran players so we can win this one game, right? Like we want to put as many people into that pressure situation as possible. Um, so yeah, as far as um, how often me and my coaches meet, we're pretty much, I'd say we're texting about the team like every day and <laughs> just trying to figure out what that week is going to look like practice-wise. Um, we have a separate coaches group me that, um, well, when it doesn't devolve into dog pictures, it's mostly about logistics for what we're going to teach, who's going to teach what part of practice, um, you know, like who who has a drill to work on this one concept and how do we make sure that the practice flows from one drill to the next and kind of builds on each other. Um, I'd say one of the tough parts in coaching a developmental team is that um, the, you know, people can come as little or as often as they want, depending on what their goals are, right? So, like, you know, the people that are super gung-ho and, and they love it and maybe they want to make the A team next year or they just, you know, want to get better as a player, they're going to be there every practice. And that's great and that's easy to teach because they're going to hear everything. But, you know, what do you, how do you help people improve who can only make it one day a week, right? Because maybe they have class or they have, other things that they're really interested into and the reason that they've self-selected into the B team is because they, they want the opportunity to do other things. So it's like, you know, we practice, say, Tuesday, Thursday, um, sometimes on Sunday when we have fields, but, you know, the main two practices, okay, you know, we say we teach some, some big new concept on Tuesday, how do we build on that on Thursday without leaving behind everybody else who couldn't make it on Tuesday? Um, so that's like the tricky part, or like, you know, say we're working on pretty basic fundamentals. How do you push the players that grasp it really quickly to focus on, you know, something one step higher, one step beyond? Um, and so that's sort of the type of stuff that the three of us are always trying to work out and um, like constantly texting about and meeting about. Um, after every tournament. Um, I started to say that coaching a developmental team is a little bit more reactionary. So, you know, we will go into a tournament and we'll, afterwards, the, the three of us will meet and we'll just write down a list of like, okay, here's all of the things that we want to work on. And, um, and, and then from, you know, say our tournaments are every two to three weeks, that will give us the, the practice plans and the vision for the next three weeks. And then we'll go into the next tournament, we'll see how those things got applied, what we've been missing, what else we need to work on, and then we'll come back those next two weeks and we'll start working on that. Does that answer your question? Yep. Cool. Yeah. Is there anything that, um, well, it sounds, it sounds like you do a really, you put a lot of work into building the community up and into promoting leadership from the captains themselves. Yeah, one, one thing that, so um, Manisha Dariani, AKS Lab, one thing that she's um, been about drilling into us ever since the rest of us started coaching in the program is that, you know, it, we, we want to run the program in such a way where, say, tomorrow all five coaches in the program disappeared the program can still run itself, right? Like we we want to we want to give them the tools and the information and have them run with it versus us doing everything for them, right? Because you don't know who's going to move away, you don't know who's going to you know for whatever life thing stop coaching the following season, and you want the program to still be its own functional microcosm without us. Cool. So, so why did you? So, what brought you to the Tarts, and how did you start coaching? Slap tricked me. <laughs> I have to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, so this is my fourth year coaching, I think. Um, and that first fall, 
Um, so again, the teams are combined, right? So every fall tournament, we try to take two teams to. And um, the other A-team coach couldn't make one of the tournaments. So she was like, hey, just come along, like hang out with the other team just so that they, you know, they're not totally lost. So I went for a, a weekend to Sonoma Grape Escape and just absolutely fell in love with it. had so much fun. Never did I think that I would make a good coach um, or, or that like it was something that I was really interested in. Um, and then, yeah, I just like I fell in love with it, and I knew right away that I, I wanted to come back in the spring. Awesome. Looks like Brent is typing uh, at the moment, so we might get a question. Um, but uh, so so you decided you wanted to do it. Like, what do you think your best? What do you think you bring to the team as a coach? What do you think your best uh, asset is for the team? Um. I think, well, you can ask the captains, but I, I'm pretty hard on them. Like, I I mean, like, yeah, it's a developmental team, but I expect a lot out of the people that come to practice. Like, I, you know, <laughs> there's, like, times where there's games where we score, you know, one or two points against the other team, and, um, uh, and I don't know, sometimes I'm like, okay, that's great, like, we scored that one point, but... We didn't do it on the break side, or like we didn't, we didn't dump and swing like we should have, or like we just like chucked it into triple coverage. So you know we can do better next time. Um, I don't know. I, I, I expect a lot out of people that come to practice, whether they come one day that month or whether they're there the entire time, and um, you know like really harping people on the on little tiny fundamental things like. Um, I have no idea how many times in practice I yell at people to turn and fake up field after they catch a throw in a drill, right? Like, so things like that. Um, just expecting a lot out of people. Awesome. Cool. Amy? Great. It looks like Brent has a question uh, for Anna. If you have any tips for new coaches who uh, would like to coach developmental teams, it may depend on if you have coached other teams, Brent, but Anna, do you have any? I mean, I think it, the thing with um, coaching, no matter what level you're coaching at, is just being prepared, right? Like, um, and, and Brent, I don't know if your question is how do I find a team to coach or if there's a team and you're thinking about coaching it, but, um, you know, no matter where or what you're coaching, you don't want to just show up to practice and wing it. You want to think about it ahead of time, think about what you're drill explanations are going to look like, think about, you know, okay, you know, are we focusing on offense or defense today and try not to just, like, jump back and forth and um, make sure that it's a practice plan that people can follow along with. Um, practice your drill explanations. Um, I I mean, like, I, I'm still not great at public speaking, but I've gotten a lot better through coaching. And that first year coaching, I honestly would get so nervous. I would practice my drill explanations on the drive over between work and practice. Like, I would say what I'm going to teach out loud because I was so nervous about, like, being up in front of 20 women and saying it. So, I don't know. I, I guess, like, yeah, just, you know, be confident. You might have to fake it till you make it a little bit and be prepared. Nice question, Brett. So Joe then asks, and we can probably feel this with the captains uh, answering, how do you inspire players who didn't make the A roster but were determined beforehand? So maybe they... Um, on our side, it's really trying to, again, what we were talking about earlier is create that tournament culture and that... I think it's really great you get in the spring is queens are great and like we have a lot of fun with them but then Tarts also has its own specific culture and its own specific friendships and its own specific um, ways of doing things and so it's really getting people involved with, within that and so I think like the mate system helps uh, when you go to tournaments to see um, and you play with people and you're able to like be that higher level of competition that also helps. Doug said, uh, 
parts is all about growth and improving. And to be honest, um, you can be as competitive as you want to be. Um, and it's like a great time for you to work on your skills and improve. And there are also people that will be like on the higher level to, to help you out with that too. So um, it's not like they're being held back. I think we do, oh, we have a lot of social events that really create the team culture. So, I mean, even if someone comes into the program wishing they were on the other team, by the, you know, close to the middle, everyone is really excited to play with each other. And by the time that we spend together on the field and off the field, we just have this amazing culture. Everyone is just supporting each other and loving each other. And it's just really amazing. So I don't think anyone regrets what happened. And that comes with communication with a lot of people, it's like communicating your expectations. So like understanding that some players expect more than others and like how to communicate those differences and how you're going to like work together so you can both have like the same experience that you want. Um, thank you, that sounds great. Uh, hopefully that answered Joe's question, but keep writing in the chat so that we can keep fielding these questions. Thanks, guys. Uh, for now, we'll move on. Oh, great. We'll move on to the next slide and talk a bit. So this is for both Anna and the captain. Um, talking a bit about the developmental division, the value you see in the division, and then Um, I can I can start with this one. Um, I think the developmental division is um, just just so so important to um, both our program um, at Cal and the larger community. Um, I mean, like in the end, when you think about it, uh, you know the the Furies and the Riots and the Brood Squads of the world. They they take on what like one to four new players every season. Right, like the majority of people are going to play ultimate in some other capacity than this, you know, the the elite division of club ultimate. And giving people that opportunity, starting with uh, in college, um, and then you know, showing them both what ultimate can be, showing them how to fall in love with the sport, um, showing them how awesome teamwork is, you know, there's, I mean, with any sport, right, you learn so many life lessons that you can apply to the rest of life. Um, uh, one thing that we try to do is um, to uh, play a lot of goal to minute practice, right, so just exposing people to other ways to have fun with the disc, um, and also a lot of mini, um, just getting a lot of touches and, you know, working on skills without it being like drill after drill after drill, which gets old. Um, sometimes we um, buddy up with the cow with the men's B team and either go to like a co-ed tournament or just play co-ed pickup or co-ed games or anything, right? Like because again, there's women's ultimate is good and great. Don't get me wrong, but mixed is also incredible, and there's so many people that are going to fall in love with mixed. So why not expose them to that early on? Um, and so on the tarts, we just have a little bit more leeway and more um, more opportunity to kind of play around and more flexibility in our season to expose people to all these other ways to, to love ultimate. I know, Captains, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think what you said, it, I think the developmental team, it, what we were talking about earlier is it just gives people the opportunity to be exposed to ultimate and fall in love with it without ha having this pressure of like completely succeeding on the field or having a lot uh, and being able to succeed on the field if you want but then also go to other activities because as college students and as like working you have like a lot of different responsibilities and so I think the development league is really important just to like have these opportunities to grow within the sport, grow within yourself, and grow um, within a community that is able to like teach you and guide you. Right, it's, there's definitely a focus for um, having ultimate as a part of your life, but also lending space to having 
other parts of your life that are occupied by other things. And so a lot of people on our team juggle really high cost loads um, and have jobs and things. And so Ultimate is maybe not the main thing in their life, but they still appreciate having the team culture and the bonds that they make with the individual players, as well as appreciating uh, the sport that they're participating in. Great, thanks. That hits a lot of these bullets. I'm hoping we can also talk a bit about what how your team measures success, and um, yeah, whether that's in terms of numbers of teammates that you have at the end of the season. Um, yeah, I could talk about that on the coaching side of things. Um, honestly, like I, I don't make very many outcome goals um, besides maybe how I talked about everybody, you know, being able to turn up field and throw with row. Um, to somebody else. Um, this year we've also added um, that every single practice we do some form of a huck drill or an away throw drill. So we want everybody to be able to not only throw to un undercuts, but um, to be able to throw deep as well. So, you know, judging success by when people are getting better at that during the huck drill. Um, we at tournaments, every game we try to set one or two offensive and one or one or two defensive goals, right? So we'll say, okay, you know, this, and yeah, sometimes we also um, update it during halftime. So we'll say, like, okay, you know, this half our defensive goal is we're focusing on our marks, so we're not getting broken around, right? If a team wants to break us on the inside, that's fine, but we're just not getting broken around. Um, or we'll say, okay, we're not getting beat up line. We're going to take that away, put our bodies in the lane, and force all of the dumps to go backwards. If they get it backwards, then we measure that as a success. Um, and just sort of showing people that um, a defense, you can't take away everything, right? You have to pick and choose what the most dangerous things are. Um, and b that um, if you really focus down and put your mind to something. Um, especially, you know, if it's a team D thing, like, okay, let's, we're going to take away the dumps, we're going to play, um, everybody's going to play underneath, upfield, and we're going to see if we can get people into those high-pressure, high-stall situations where they just sort of chuck it away or we actually stall them out. Like, that kind of team defense is the things that we're focusing on. Um, or, you know, uh, swinging the disc and, and scoring our goals on the break side or on the high side if it's really windy, things like that. Um, for, <laughs> this is a good one, so when we play zone, um, like, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, there's not really time before, like, the first two tournaments to even talk about zone at practice, so we just don't even bother as coaches, and usually what we do is we'll either chat with um, the other coaches before our games and just say, like, hey, are you planning to play any sort of zone on us, um, you know, just to give us a heads up. Um, we usually don't tell the team until it happens, and we call a timeout and we really quickly in like 30 seconds draw out, okay, this is called zone, this is what they're doing to us, this is how we want to try to beat it. And so, you know, depending on what type of zone it is, how many um, people are in the cup, whether they're trapping or not, one or both sides, et cetera, um, we'll tell them, okay, you know, this is, um, this, is the, this is the puzzle that the handlers are trying to solve for us, and... Um, it might take us 10 points to get out of or around or over that or through that cup. Um, but, you know, even if, if we can do that and say we don't even score, right, like so we just work on getting closer and closer and closer to um, solving that, that zone problem. And um, I don't know, I mean, like <laughs> I keep thinking of this one point last or one game last year where, um, we call a timeout, we drew out what they were doing, and we're like, okay, you know, let's keep it off the trap side, and handlers pop into the cup, try to, you know, work together to um, break it through, and, you know, we'll just, we'll see if we can get out of this trap. And it literally took us 10 tries to just, you know, we would get closer and closer and closer of, like, getting around that cup, and then there would be some sort of turnover, or, like, we'd make some silly mistake where we threw it into a coach, and... Um, you could see people 
working it out, like, oh, like, where are the poaches going to come from? Where should, like, the handlers be? How do the poppers find those spaces? And it took us literally 10 points, but we finally broke out and we scored it. And, like, the pandemonium and, like, people rushing the field and, like, the high fives, like, I think, like, I don't know, like, I was almost in tears because I was so excited. Um, it was, like, the best moment ever, right? Like, we lost the game, I don't know, 13-1 or 15-1, but we felt like we won the tournament just because we worked so hard on this one thing and we were able to solve that, that puzzle at the end. Yeah, it's crazy the amount of things that we've learned on the sideline at tournaments. <laughs> um, it's pretty frustrating, like, when we're, like, trying to work through it, but it is the best feeling ever once we figure it out, and we, like, don't even pay attention to the score. And that comes back to the goal setting, and, like, that's how you, like, measure accomplishment within this team and measure success within this team is you have very specific goals, and then you just, like, keep working towards those so you never feel overwhelmed by a loss or overwhelmed by, like, the lack of knowledge if you, like, keep working up and you keep building. Yeah, I think the coaches actually might be making an effort to not tell us the score. So at the end of the game, they're like, oh, you won. And we're like, we're, we're like what? And they're like, what? That's great. But, like, that's not our number one priority. Yeah, if we know the score at all. <laughs> I, I literally lose count at 1-1. One, one. I just, I can't. I'm incapable of keeping score. Does it take a lot to have, um, I assume, I, I mean, I'm just in that imagining you're down, you've only scored one point, and, and for sure it's, the energy is high because you've worked hard towards this goal. I'm, I'm, do you have pe teammates who do care about the score? Do you have to have these kinds of conversations with them um, that to realign them with your team, team values of really? Yeah, I think you definitely have people who are a little bit more competitive and who can get a lot more frustrated when we're losing, and I think it's just, um, a lot of it is people realizing it themselves and taking a moment to take a breath and to, like, realize where they're at and, like, where the team's at and what they can do to, like, work with the team. Um, and I think that it's also helpful that we normally don't have just one or two players. It's a couple players, and so they can find support within each other and they can find, um, like, the greater level of skill that they want and they can, like, practice with each other. And I think that's how they can um, improve and, like, let that outlet out. Uh, I think the major, I think, issue with the, at the very beginning of the season is people, a lot of people come in with expectations that we're going to do a lot better in games, and, and it's just building that, that culture and learning how each player interacts with each other, and so during those games, us as, like, the captains have to make sure that everyone stays as positive as possible, and so we have all these sideline cheers, and we make sure that people are always splitting the field. Um, and puffing everyone up on the sideline. Um, and so that can be exhausting, but it's also really rewarding to have everyone remain positive throughout and, like, know that you've made a contribution to keeping the spirit of the, the game and the spirit of the team up. Yeah, one cool thing that's um, that happened recently is so we go and hang out and play either scrimmage or, like, play with the Berkeley High women's team, a um, uh, girls team, I guess, the youth team. And... Um, our first practice, or our first scrimmage against them, um, we had our captains lead a team warm-up for everybody, and then, um, you know, we ended up playing them. And it was a, a really fun game, and, you know, our sidelines were um, super loud, and, and every time there was a goal, like, regardless of who scored it, our team was rushing the field and, like, high-fiving each other. And afterwards, the coach um, was telling me, she's like, she's like, it's so impressive to see how positive your team is and how, um, like, confident in each other and themselves all those women are. Um, and it's such a good, it's it's such a, um, like, inspiration and um, to those high school girls, right, because a lot of them have only ever played mixed ultimate, and as you can imagine, in, in mixed high school ultimate, the boys sort of take over and they're always calling the lines and they're leading the cheers and, you know, whatnot. And all of a sudden it's now falling on all of them and they get super shy and kind of like worried about like, 
how they sound or how they look or, you know, just all of the things that high school girls worry about. And for them to see these, like, strong, confident, um, excited women go out there and play and, like, show them what it means to be good teammates to each other, um, that was a really cool compliment for me to hear that I shared with the rest of the team. Amy, you're muted again. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, thanks. What a great anecdote, Anna. Um, I'll move on to the next slide, which is also our last slide, and talking about what do you love about this heart? We sort of covered a bit. Um, one of my favorite things um, and I feel like this is something I've said at our end of the year banquet every year is like I just love watching like a watching people fall in love with the sport and realizing the opportunities that they have through it and um, you know just like getting that competitive outlet for those who need it um, but just like watching people develop into confident women right like you you know you get these little freshmen in the fall and they come into a brand new sport and they have no idea how to throw and they're just super shy and they're apologizing for every single thing that they're doing. Um, and, you know, by the end of the season, which, which by the way, I have a no apologies um, rule at my practices. I make people say thank you instead of sorry. Um, so, like, uh, you know, if you, like, throw a crazy errant throw instead of apologizing for it, you, like, thank them for um, like sprinting down to go get it or um, or like thank you for being patient with me um, because we as women just apologize too much as it is um, so no apologizing at my practices um, but yeah so um, you know yeah watching these you know same freshmen who who are just like so shy and so unsure of themselves by the end of the season like going out there and attacking the open lane or, like, putting their body and boxing somebody out of the lane, um, setting a really high aggressive mark, um, busting out a full field forehand hook, and, you know, or, you know, even something simple as just even cheering on the sideline, like, knowing what to yell at, at somebody else um, and being comfortable enough to use their voices in that way and being comfortable enough to, like, run out there and high-five each other and feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Um, that's that's honestly, like, why I love coaching the B team and, like, watching rookies both fall in love with the sport but also, like, develop into these incredible, confident women. What's not to love about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just we all have fun playing Frisbee. It's a huge stress reliever from, like, college life and midterms and things like that and you make friends for life like we came in the same rookie year you came in last year and we ended up going on like a road trip together this summer like your friends for life um just the culture that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis i don't know there's anything to add yeah i definitely really appreciated how supportive uh the team culture is i came into college wanting to do a team sport because I had never played. I mean, I'd done sports, but it, they were very kind of centered on the individual. Um, and so I really found myself in this team culture, and I, I just really, I really loved it. It made me think about sports in a different way, um, and I made such great friends that I know I'm going to be keeping up with even after I leave Berkeley. I just I love the fact that we interact with each other in and off on and off the field. So we, we always are hanging out with each other outside of practice, which is so great. <laughs> yeah, I think I said it at the beginning, but it's just I remember my very first Queen's practice and like my very first time um, actually playing Ultimate and I just remember calling my mom and saying like how impressed I was by these women and like how I just wanted to be like them and how um, I, like, I really, like, thought I, like, found my place within college, and I think having, and then, like, moving into the Tarts and seeing uh, how I grew with my, my friends.
friends and how I grew, like, my leadership and my confidence ability of, I'm definitely not, like, the best player on tarts or definitely not within the program, but the fact that I feel comfortable being able to help other people and being able to, like, experience this team and, like, be a part, an important part of this team, I think really speaks to the support that you get from everybody, and that could be within Ultimate, within class, within other things going on. So it's, again, going back to that community-level basis. Uh -oh. We had a muting problem. Cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, well, it's so great that we have both the coach and the captain of a team on because uh, I feel like if I asked Anna this directly, it would be a little like she would be bashful about answering or something. But. I'm wondering if the captains can talk a little bit about um, if you have any ultimate goals after TARTS, um, if the coaches have helped you realize these goals, and uh, perhaps not even just ultimate goals, but so much as professional goals, if you're seeing. I think, um, well, I have this one anecdote, I guess. I. I live on the East Coast, or my family lives on the East Coast, and so after finishing the uh, spring semester last year, I went back and spent the summer with my family, and Mad Dog reached out to me and asked if I was interested in doing Club Ultimate, and I had no idea about any of the opportunities there, and so she actually helped me connect with another team that I ended up practice playing with for a little bit, and it was just really great to have that support, because otherwise I don't think I would have to like, know anything. That. They also have been um, trying to get as many people involved. We tried to get a lot of people out to the women's mixer last weekend um, and just make it so that everyone knows about the opportunities that are available during the summer, like Pickup Ultimate um, and the other club team. I think we do a really good job of that. And I definitely think one of the coolest things about playing on a club team in Ultimate is that you're um, with, like, girls of, or women of all different ages. So I remember my freshman year, I was really close with the grad students. That was, like, really cool for me to be able to see this woman who had, like, grown through Ultimate through, like, her undergraduate career. And, like, this was her first year of grad school, and she really, I think, taught me a lot about how to use Ultimate to the benefit in college. And so um, it's definitely a great way just to, like, look at other, how other women have dealt with some issues and, like, can seek advice and guidance for them. Uh, I don't know. The Frisbee environment is, like, no other now that I've experienced it. Like, I don't want it to end after college. Um, I briefly practiced and played for a club team this summer, too, and I'm going to be doing that later on. Yeah. Once you are exposed to it, you never want to. I'll add one other um, real quick. So uh, I, I, I do civil engineering work um, at a little engineering firm um, not too far from campus. And um, one thing we do every winter is um, stormwater sampling during the rainy season. And for the last two years, um, I've always had either a pike wing or a tart um, helping me as like a little storm duty tech in that program. Um, so that get, gives people an ex exposure to um, what we do as hydraulic engineers and hydrologists. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other thing that um, our captains have been really good about um, for both programs is just uh, making sure that both teams, um, you know, kind of what Chip was saying, that there's there's more to Ultimate and there's more out there than what's inside of our program at Cal, right? There's this whole other community and there's volunteer opportunities and there's clinics and there's high school teams and, you know, youth programs and all of these different ways to get involved. And, um, you know, hopefully between the, the five of us coaches, we've been... We've been trying to at least expose them to what else is out there besides Cal.
Thanks, Anna. Amy, I've got you unmuted now. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so Lauren is asking a question here. For So how do we encourage people to show up more than once a week, especially when they have other commitments? Do you have strategies to handle teaching and reteaching and challenging players over time? Uh, and then, so it sounds like... One thing that we do um, is that every Sunday evening, the coaches send out a survey, an attendance survey for that week. Um, and so we just try to get people to think about, okay, yeah, you know, I have all of these other things going on, but there's practice Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And um, so far, it seems that, um, or for at least from what I hear, captains can chime in. It seems that if people say that they're a yes, they're more likely later to try to rearrange their schedule or to make it work even if they're really tired because they kind of feel like they're a little bit locked in even though it's a non-binding pull. Um, but just sort of like the physical act of, you know, Monday thinking about, okay, yeah, this is a thing that's coming up for the remainder of the week. Um, that's one thing we do. Um, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, it's, it's a struggle. Um, yesterday we had five people at practice because it's midterm and it's midterm season and it's right before spring break. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we have, what, like 30 people technically on our roster and we could only field five yesterday, three of those being captains. So, yeah, I mean, like, it gets rough sometimes. Um, it, one thing that helps us is having that huge roster to pull from. So, you know, we do carry, like, technically 30 to 32 people. Um, just because we don't make cuts so anybody can come play and um, sort of join as they want. Um, and, um, you know, if you get 50% of a 14-person roster, that's a rough practice. But if you get 50% of a 30-person roster, all of a sudden you have seven on seven you can scrimmage. Um, so that's one thing that helps us is just, like, recruiting like crazy and trying to get um, a lot of people um, hooked on ultimate really early on before all the midterms start happening. How'd you, Amy? Oh, hang on. Let me unmute the captains now. All right. Go for it, Ann. Okay. So our main recruiting for the entire year begins at the beginning of the fall semester when we have um, all the freshmen coming in. Um, there's a really big event called Caltopia. There's Calapalooza and Caltopia, but we have a really big presence at Caltopia, and we have our own tent where we everyone who walks by um, can sign their email into this really big listserv, and then... Uh, we have flyers around uh, campus, and we give out flyers to at Caltopia. And so once that's over, we have this really big list of people who are at all interested in Ultimate. And then we organize a meeting time, and so captains put together a presentation. We reserve a room for about an hour, um, sometime at the beginning when we've just started practice. And so everyone shows up to that, and we explain the team culture, what Ultimate is, because a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, explain like the practice times that you need um, and we show a lot of cool videos of people doing awesome things in Ultimate which is usually pretty popular um, and then our first practice that we invite everyone to we usually get I don't know like 60 to 80 people yeah. total even like with sets and um, the new rookies combined and so it kind of filters out throughout that time but that's really the main thing that we do to get people to come out um, and we do our best to make sure that Rookies and vets are interacting with each other. All the vets are reaching out to the rookies to throw at the beginning of the season to make sure everyone feels included. Um, and I think we just really try and help people from the, from the outset. Like that. I think we're lucky because we go to such a big school. I think we have like 30,000 people. So I, I don't know how it would work with a smaller college. But as an Poppins, you gotta speak up, girl. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you gotta use your camera. Yeah, yeah. Little louder. 
Um, well, I think we're just blessed with the fact that we have like 30,000 undergrads at our school. So uh, we have a big pool to, to like draw from. Um, so we don't really do that much in terms of recruiting. We just, um, we do Calpulu the Calpulia and then people come to us. But um, yeah, we try to reach out and make sure that everyone is included at our practices and that we have that's talking to all of the students and not being clicked to each other. <laughs> and the, the inclusion thing is huge, right? Especially for young women. Um, and especially for young women who are finding a brand new sport that they know nothing about is just, you know, having people there who are going to take them in and treat them as one of their own and be excited for the first time they complete a forehand, um, you know, like making them part of that clan is just so huge. And um, I feel like as long as you can, you know, as long as you find a way to get people out to that first practice, retaining them is is less hard. That, that's the easy part, right? Because um, that's that's kind of where your team culture comes in and that the positivity and being a part of something. It's just, yeah, that first step of how do you get people interested enough to actually come out? That's the tricky, the tricky part. Cool. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. And then there's a one last question from Joe, which I think you guys touched on earlier about uh, mixing practices between your dev and your A team. Um, but I think uh, sort of, can you walk through like when you go kind of walk back through sort of when do you mix practices and then how do you balance those practices or, and how often do you do you do them? So our entire fall semester is um, combined. So everybody's together. Um, there's like, I don't know, between 30 and 50 people at every practice. Um, so I don't know exactly, Joe, what you mean by balancing that practice, um, but we, you know, there's, in those practices, there's no distinction about which team you're on, and there's really no distinction about whether you're a new addition to the program versus a veteran. Everybody's doing the same drills. Um, everybody has equal opportunity to, say, try handling a practice. Um, uh, you know, the fall and developmental teams are so much about individual feedback. Um, that's part of the reason that we have three coaches for um, our little B team, you know, which might seem like overkill, but God, I wish we had like 10 so that each person could have somebody watching them and giving them just personalized feedback over and over again. Um, balancing skill levels, ah, I see. Yeah, so um, I mean, Honestly, like, there's so many fundamental things that you can work on that um, that everybody can benefit from, right? Like, these are like these are drills that we do on Fury that um, to work on our fundamentals, and we bring them to um, those those mixed practices um, in the fall. Um, I think you know for the for your veterans on the A team, it might feel a little bit slow, or it might feel, um, you know, they might get a little bit bored. But I think what it comes down to is, you know, then bringing them into um, into sort of the coaching role and and taking a rookie under their wing and really like walking them through and um, you know teaching and running practices, um, things that sort of step outside of okay, we're you know. We're doing a really boring throwing drill yet again, that type of thing. Um, after the split happens, we don't really have any official practices um, that are mixed. And captains, maybe you guys can talk about whether you do any like fun things together with the A-team Risby wise. We have joint socials, um, and we also have a group me that's with both teams, um, and people just post there like on a daily basis asking if anyone wants to throw on the blade or anything like that. So we don't have official practices, but we still do intermingle with them. They're still our friends, too. <laughs> but now we don't have any uh, practices together. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Does anyone else have any other questions at this time? Doesn't look like anyone's typing, so I, I'm going to take that as a no. 
chart captains, and I want to say thank you so much for taking time. This was like really, really informative and really helpful. Um, for those of you who are in the webinar, thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for asking really good questions. Hopefully, you found some value out of this. Um, again, this will be this was recorded, so it'll be up on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, thank you all so very much. Any any last parting words of wisdom for for Anna or the captains? Mm. Anybody wants to um, chat about anything later? My email is anna.nazarov at gmail.com. I'm always happy to talk about coaching things or developmental team things with people. I get really excited about it. I'm going to type that out, Anna, so people have it. Uh, see it. All right. Well, I think that will bring this to a close. Thank you again, everybody.